Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Brian Crombie Show on uh, on Saga 960. Uh, I want to introduce you tonight to Douglas Elliott, who is a lawyer with, I think it's Campbell LLC. He's a uh, constitutional lawyer. Um, he uh, is a friend of Clayton Ruby, who uh, was a giant, uh, most people thought, in the legal community in Canada. Uh, Douglas is an LGBT uh, activist. Uh, he uh, has practiced law for a couple of decades, uh, and he knew Clayton Ruby uh, well, uh, both personally and in uh, in the legal circles. And I thought it would be really helpful to have uh, Douglas join us tonight and tell us a little bit about uh, his friend, his colleague, uh, Clayton Ruby, um, what he was known for, and uh, and what he thinks of uh, of his legacy. Uh, Mr. Elliott, thank you so much for joining us. Welcome to the show. Thanks very much. And it's Cambridge, by the way, not Campbell, but that's I apologize. okay. Cambridge, Cambridge LLC. I apologize about that. Yeah. Um, Clayton Ruby is someone that I think all of us have heard a little bit about. And we've heard yes. about, uh, you know, his fight for abortion rights, uh, his, his fight uh, for people that were wrongfully uh, uh, convicted. We've heard uh, for his fight uh, for, uh, for gay rights, um, LGBT rights. Um, but tell us a little bit of, about the man, the lawyer, and some of these cases that he was so involved in that became so renowned. And, you know, the one that comes to mind to me the most is Henry Morgenthaler, which was really quite a long time ago when, uh, when, right. you know, Roe versus Wade uh, was just, uh, was, it was just topical. Uh, and so it was, it's a fight that he has fought for, for a long period of time. Yes, indeed. Well, one of many causes that Clay was involved in. I think one of the things that's so impressive about Clay's legacy is that there wasn't a, a social justice issue, whether it was abortion rights, gay rights, animal rights, transit, the environment, you name it. Uh, just about every socially progressive cause that came along uh, Clay was involved in it, and uh, he played an active role in, in promoting uh, many causes and, and very effectively. But um, it wasn't uh, obvious that that's where Clay was uh, going to end up. You know, uh, a lot of people don't know this about Clay, but he actually came from a very privileged background. Um, his father was a very successful uh, publisher. Uh, he published uh, scandal sheets, uh, you know, the sort of National Enquirer kind of stuff that you'd get in the grocery store. That's where Clay's father made his money. But he was he was uh, came from quite a privileged background and uh, Jewish, of course. And uh, uh, in fact, one of my friends uh, who's a police officer said his earliest memory is pulling Clay over. He was driving his father's Rolls Royce and was very suspicious to see this young man behind the wheels of a Rolls Royce. And of course, Clay talked himself out of that problem uh, as only Clay could. Um, but he, uh, Clay was uh, always a committed uh, person to social justice, despite his privileged background. And it would have been very easy for him to just live off dad's money or get a cushy job at a Bay Street law firm, but that wasn't his nature. Uh, not only did Clay have a fierce intellect, but he was also uh, very passionate about uh, social justice. He was very much um, a child of the 60s in many ways. Uh, you know, he got his start uh, with a uh, a sidewalk law office that he set up in Yorkville back in the days. This is sort of the two sides of Clay, you know, always connected with Yorkville. His office has been there for many years on Prince Edward Street. But uh, now, of course, Yorkville, people think of it as being a very posh area. Uh, and it is. And and Clay but it wasn't that. in the 60s and 70s. It wasn't in the 60s and 70s. Back then, it was a hippie central. And a uh, big issue back then, of course, was uh, the draft. But there were other issues that people uh, were having with the law. And Clay uh, set up on a sidewalk in Yorkville, uh, giving free legal advice to people passing by uh, who had concerns. And uh, that, that came to an end when the Law Society ca called him on the carpet and said that that wasn't appropriate. Uh, but he continued to do much the same thing uh, from inside. Where do you uh, think this uh, social justice passion came from, if he had such a privileged background? Yeah, I, I think, uh, as they say, part of it, I think, was 
um, Clay's, uh, the, the time when Clay grew, you know, became a young man was in the 60s when uh, I was very young, I was, I'm a little younger than Clay, so, but I was still very much aware in the 60s was all the, the civil rights movement, the resistance to the Vietnam War, all of that was very much in the news. And I think that's what really impacted on Clay when he was a young man. And of course, uh, Toronto at that time was full of American draft dodgers. And so the, the peace movement uh, in the 60s, I think, had a very powerful influence on Clay. But there were a number of other uh, social justice movements that really took off at that time, right? Women's rights, uh, gay rights, uh, anti-racism, um, all of those things really started to take off in the 1960s. And uh, Clay, I think, took to that, all of those moves. I think Clay's big problem was he couldn't decide which movement he loved the best <laughs> because Got he, involved in them all. he embraced all of them. Um, and you, and of course, uh, a lot of those people that we're talking about, um, he, I think he liked a good fight. Uh, he never liked the police much. I think he very early on formed a dim view of the police and he always felt it was his duty to stand up to authority and to protect people who were uh, vulnerable to being pushed around by authority. And uh, you couldn't ask for a better champion than Clay Ruby. He was tough, he was persistent, he was articulate, and he was very intelligent. And he had a very fertile mind. He was always able to come up with new ideas about how to use the legal system to get what his client wanted. Uh, and of course, when the Charter of Rights came along, that was like, a, you know, the greatest thing for Clay, because it gave him a whole new toolkit to work with, uh, to advance his client's interests. Because uh, don't forget, you know, before 1982, uh, the Morgenthaler would never have happened. Uh, the Douglas case that he did for the LGBT community, that would never have happened. Uh, he was really, up until 1985, 1982, 1985, in that period in the 60s and 70s, mostly what Clay was doing was defending people from the oppression of the state. So, for example, famously in Toronto in the 70s, the uh, body politic LGBT newspaper was charged with obscenity. Their subscribers, I mean, they, the police did everything they possibly could to crack down on that newspaper, part of a whole period of oppression that culminated really with the bathhouse raids. And Clay was representing the body politic, and he was very effectively using the media. That's another thing that Clay, I think, will be remembered for. You know, uh, when I went to law school in the, in the late 70s, uh, early 80s, uh, we were told, you know, don't talk to the media. Like what I'm doing now would be considered verboten. Uh, we, you, you were never. They don't trust the media. Uh, never talk about your clients' causes. Just keep your head down and look after your clients and and make your arguments in court. Clay never bought that, and that I think that reflects his uh, being his father's son. You know, his father was a publisher. And his father uh, knew about how to use the media to sell a story. And the uh, acorn didn't fall far from the tree in that regard. Clay loved the media and the media loved him. He knew how to um, have a quip that would capture an issue and to sell a case in the media. And he did it very effectively. We're chatting very tonight with Douglas Elliott, who is a friend, a colleague, of uh, Clayton Ruby, who passed away last week. Uh, we're going to take a break for some messages and come back uh, in just two minutes uh, with uh, Douglas Elliott. Uh, and I'm going to ask him about some of the cases that uh, are well known and uh, and a little bit of uh, the legal background, because uh, I think it's important to understand uh, what a uh, what an incredible legal mind Clayton Ruby was, as well as his ability to get media attention and uh, and to strive for social justice. Everyone, uh, just stay with us. Two minutes. We'll be back with Douglas Elliott. Welcome back, everyone, to the Brian Crombie Radio Hour on Saga 960. We're chatting tonight with Douglas Elliott, 
who is a lawyer in Toronto. He uh, works with, it's Cambridge LLC, is that correct? LLP. Yes. LLP. Cambridge LLP, I apologize. Um, he is a, uh, I think you said a constitutional lawyer uh, and uh, an LGBT uh, uh, rights activist. Uh, he has known Clayton Ruby uh, for for a couple decades. He's a colleague, he's a friend. Um, and, uh, and, and I reached out to him. Um, actually, I reached out to a friend of mine who's a litigation lawyer and she said the best person that you could speak to uh, that knew uh, and can speak very, uh, very uh, frankly and openly and com comprehensively about uh, Clayton Ruby is Douglas Elliott. So I got referred to you by who someone I think highly of. And so she obviously thinks highly of you. So thank you so much for uh, joining us. No um, maybe I could ask you if I could a little bit of uh, background on some of the cases, because I think that uh, that's really quite interesting. So the Henry Morgan Tyler case um, uh, and, right. and, I'm going to give you my layman's version, and maybe you could give me the the legal version if you could. Sure. But I've been told that we don't actually have a law in Canada that legalizes abortion. And so therefore, the rights that we have to abortion in Canada for a woman's right to choose are comparable to what the United States had prior to the Supreme Court finding against uh, Roe v. Wade uh, most recently. So it yep. was the Henry Morgan Tyler case that Clay Ruby, Clayton Ruby took forward that effectively said that the rights that were in the Charter of Rights that did not uh, list um, the right to an abortion as a, as a right, he had effectively extended to abortion. And so that's what we have. And so a lot of Canadians think we actually have a law that legalizes abortion. We don't. And, and at times, different governments have talked or not talked about either having a law or having a law against it. Uh, but we actually are sort of similar where the United States was a couple months ago um, with yeah. a, uh, a legal case that was one uh, that established that right. And so I want you, if you could, talk a little bit about the importance of the, 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 the Charter of Rights and how in Canada we have, from what I, ex uh, from what I understand, sort of extended rights that were elucidated in the Charter of Rights to other rights, while um, in the United States, in the most, me most recent finding, um, and again, very simplistically layman's, but what the Supreme Court in the United States found is that if the rights didn't exist at the time that the, uh, that the U.S. Constitution and Bill of Rights were uh, written, that they didn't want to extend the rights. And so they, they're actually looking back to the 1700s or 1800s uh, rather than uh, the Constitution and the Bill of Rights being a living document, while in Canada, ours is a living document. Is that at all close to, uh, to what uh, what what the situation is in abortion in Canada versus the United States? It, it's pretty good, I got to tell you. <laughs> so um, there is a significant difference between the two countries' constitutions, but you're quite right. There is no law that, quote unquote, legalized abortion in Canada. Uh, we, uh, like the United States, for a long time, our law reflected traditional Christian uh, thinking on the subject of abortion, and it was banned outright for a period of time. And then we had a law that allowed abortion, but put a lot of conditions on it, a lot of strict conditions, and it made it very difficult to actually get an abortion, especially in areas where the majority of the population was Catholics. And of course, we have a, a long tradition in this country of Catholic hospitals. So to this day, there's many Catholic hospitals in Canada where you cannot get an abortion because it's contrary to their religious principles. Um, so this law was challenged by a very famous doctor, Dr. Henry Morgenthaler, who believed passionately that women had a right to an abortion, that it was a medically necessary treatment. And he found the uh, situation that we were in in Canada unacceptable, where women had to jump through all of these hoops and often would end up being denied. So he set up a freestanding clinic, the Morgan Dollar Clinic, it eventually was called, to and started setting them later setting them up across Canada to make abortion more readily accessible to women. And he was very clear from the beginning that he was not going to comply with the law, that he felt the law was unconstitutional. And he was prosecuted and- uh, And jailed, it, I believe, was he not? He was, yeah, he, and he was, uh, he was arrested. Uh, he went to jail, he was tried. And uh, the, um, it was a jury trial and Clay Ruby persuaded the a jury to acquit Henry Morgenthaler to effectively what we call nullify the law. 
Um, eventually, the law, this law was challenged up to the Supreme Court of Canada, actually a couple of times. Uh, and the Supreme Court of Canada, uh, and it was cases involving Henry Morgenthaler, uh, it was a long, hard battle for Dr. Morgenthaler and very public. He was very much in the public eye, as was Clay. And that was nasty because the people who are against anti-choice, uh, they're very vocal. Uh, doctors in the United States have been murdered by uh, anti-choice uh, folks. Uh, the, you know, they, they don't believe in the right to life for abortion doctors. That's pretty clear, um, a lot of them. So Morgan Toller, he was a very brave guy. Uh, and eventually the Supreme Court of Canada said in the Morgan Toller case, that the law as it stood at that time violated section seven and section eight of the, as I recall, of the uh, charter. That essentially section seven protects fundamental personal choices that we make. It's our liberty interest, we call it. And it, they found that the woman's right to choose was protected in there. And they agreed that in some circumstances, it might be possible for parliament to restrict the right to abortion, but that the law as it stood at, at that time uh, was unduly restrictive of a woman's rights. And so that law had to go. And since that time, several prime ministers have contemplated trying to draft a law that would restrict access to abortion, uh, but they've never managed to come up with a law that was going to both get the support of parliamentarians and pass muster in the court. So we've been without an abortion ban uh, for many years. Technically, that law is still sitting there. It's just been declared unconstitutional. So theoretically, some future Supreme Court could say, oh, well, we got it wrong and that law springs back to life. Um, but that's extremely unlikely. Which would, which uh, would be sort of similar to the the current case of Roe v. Wade or current right, situation? Right, right. So States? our Supreme Court, like the United States Supreme Court, our Supreme Court can reverse itself, but it doesn't happen very often. And in the United States, it's very clear that the reason the Supreme Court of the United States has reversed themselves is because the Republicans have stacked the Supreme Court of the United States with very conservative jurists who are, as you say, they're reinventing constitutional law in the United States. And they're saying that unless a right is historically well grounded in United States history, then you don't have a right under the United States Constitution. Well, I'm here to tell you, if you know American history, there are no rights that are well grounded in the United States history. The United States was never originally a country of rights. It was a country of um, uh, systematic religious intolerance and oppression. It was, a, it was a country of genocide against the native population. It was a country of enslavement, the industrialized slavery of, uh, of Africans. That's the historical America that the current Supreme Court harkens back to. Uh, it was not a rights-based society. So they really want to turn back the clock and get rid of constitutional rights altogether, as far as I'm concerned. Fortunately, in Canada, that hasn't happened. Uh, it actually started before the Charter of Rights with the so-called persons case, which a lot of your listeners will know about, where women were recognized as persons under Canadian constitution back in the before the Second World War, actually, when the England still was the final place for appeals, the Judicial Committee of the Privy Council. So uh, we had from that case, the doctrine of the living tree that Canada's constitution is not frozen in time. We don't look back to where, what it looked like. We don't look back to England. We look to current social circumstances and we interpret our constitution in light of modern Canadian society and the law develops to reflect that. That has been our constitutional tradition for almost a hundred years now. And I don't think it's going to change. And Clay, of course, was a lawyer who 
uh, believed in improving the conditions of the socially oppressed, whether it was women or whether it was gay people. Um, he even believed in the rights of animals, uh, which was, which, you know, remains pretty marginal in this country there, you know, in Australia and some other countries, uh, there's been this movement to try and give animals more rights. Uh, but it, it, Clay was one of the few lawyers in Canada that I know that was even pushing that argument that social justice should extend not just to human beings, but to animals as well. Fascinating. And, and am I correct, therefore, in saying that uh, uh, Clayton Ruby is one of those people that have effectively created this right to, to choice in Canada uh, through this oh, case with Henry Morgenthaler? He, he and Henry Morgenthaler, I think, are the two people who are responsible. Henry, of course, if you're a social justice lawyer or a constitutional lawyer, you can't do anything without a courageous client. You know, we, we, we don't invent clients. We have to have clients who are willing to challenge the law. But Clayton was the kind of guy that if you wanted to challenge the law, if you had the guts to do it, he would take on anyone including the government of Canada, and he would fight to the bitter end to get justice. Another case that I'm very familiar with is the Michelle Douglas case, which uh, there was a time beginning in the Cold War when um, LGBT people were barred, actively barred from federal employment. And that policy continued, if you can believe it, until 1992 in the context of the military and the RCMP. Now, Clayton, he always disliked the military. He always disliked the police. He knew that he that they had a file on him and he fought for years to get access to his own file. Um, so he and he had always been a friend of the LGBT community. You know, today, everyone's a friend of the LGBT community. You know, there's a, a, every mayor go every politician they all want to march in the pride parade these days you know even doug ford has marched even in doug the pride ford, parade. Amazing. even doug ford has marched in a pride parade but back in the 70s we were hated uh and we had almost no friends very few straight people would go near us with the barge pole but clay had that reputation that he was willing to stand up for the oppressed and uh, had been involved with the body politic, as they say, represented people who were charged in the bathhouse raids. And so uh, Michelle Douglas was a young uh, military police officer, and she got uh, uh, fired because she was denied her security clearance because she was gay. And uh, Clay, Sven Robinson uh, put uh, her in touch with Clay, and Clay took on the case. And he fought for years, first of all, challenging her security clearance. And then he decided, along with his uh, beloved wife, Harriet Sachs, who is now Madam Justice uh, Harriet Sachs, but for a time, Harriet and Clay were not just partners in life, they were law partners. Um, they, they took on the Canadian government and they challenged this uh, ban on gays in the military. And eventually in October of 1992, they were successful. And Clay, one of the interesting things about that case is that Clay, for Clay, it wasn't just about getting justice for Michelle Douglas. For him, it was about changing society. Just as he did in the Morgenthaler case, it wasn't, it wasn't just about Henry Morgenthaler or one particular woman who wanted to get an abortion. For Clay, that was about a woman's right to choose. It was about changing society so that Canadian women could get access to abortion anywhere in the country. In, in Michelle Douglas' case, he thought it was wrong that LGBT folks should be denied employment in the military or the police or any or other or anywhere in the federal government or anywhere else for that matter, but in the federal government in particular. Of course, Clay Ruby himself would no sooner uh, work for the military than jump in the lake. <laughs> you know, it was, he, he did not like the military. He probably didn't understand why Michelle wanted to work for them, but he was prepared to fight for her right to do that. He thought it was wrong that she was refused. And eventually, 
uh, the case was settled on the basis that the government of Canada recognized that the policy was unconstitutional, and it marked the end of the ban on gays in the military. But not only that, uh, I want to get pay tribute to Clay on this point. Um, that was one of the first clear constitutional victories for the LGBT community under the Charter of Rights, 1992. And after 1992, we went from success to success. There is a straight line you can draw from the Michelle Douglas case to same-sex marriage. Okay, so, so if, if you could, as, as a lawyer, explain to me, uh, from what I understand, there's, there's, there's no reference to, uh, to um, sexual orientation in the Constitution. So how did he establish that right? Okay, so there was quite a debate and interestingly, Clay was very aware of that debate because he and Sven Robinson are good friends. And Sven Robinson was very much involved in that debate about what Section 15 of the Charter of Rights was going to look like. Section 15 is our equality guarantee under the Charter of Rights. And it says you can't be discriminated against based on the following grounds. And then it lists the grounds. And you're quite right, sexual orientation is not one of those grounds. And in 1982, there was quite a push to expand the list of grounds. And the two grounds that were pushed hard were disability and sexual orientation. The disability folks got added to the list and the LGBT community got excluded. It was considered too controversial in 1982. However, because of pressure like Sven Rob from people like Sven Robinson, uh, Jean Chrétien, who is then the Attorney General, decided to change the wording of Section 15. And instead of having a list that was clearly a closed list, the list basically said you can't be discriminated on the following, including on the following grounds. And so the implication of the wording was that that list was not exhaustive, that there might be other uh, uh, categories that were not mentioned. And when the debate took place in Parliament, Sven Robinson asked Jean Chrétien, and he said, is that in what the intention was in changing the wording? And Chrétien said, yes. And Robinson said, and wouldn't that, one of the things that's left off the list that might be implied, sexual orientation? And Chrétien said, yes. So what they had done was basically left the door open and thrown the ball back to the courts and let the courts decide whether sexual orientation is sufficiently similar to race, religion, or the other things listed, that it deserves protection. And that fight had been going on from 1982 to 1992. And uh, Clay Ruby persuaded them of two things. First of all, that sexual orientation was going to be found to be included. And he was right about that because uh, four years later, in a case called Egan, the Supreme Court of Canada said that that was in fact the case. And secondly, and this was the more important thing, under our charter, section one, it says, all of our rights are subject to such reasonable limits as are demonstrably justified in a free and democratic society. And the military and the RCMP had taken the position that well, yeah, maybe gay people are protected under Section 15, but Section 1 allows discrimination against gay people where it's justifiable. And it's justifiable to discriminate against them in the military and RCMP context for various reasons. There's a great, I, if people want to hear more about Clay's involvement, he actually recorded a video, which you can see on YouTube, uh, the LGBT Purge Fund Survivor Stories, and he describes his involvement in the case. And it's really kind of funny, some of it, uh, where he was uh, harassing generals about uh, conditions on submarines. And so what, why does it matter to you if you're standing naked in front of a gay man? You know, he's not touching you. What's the difference? Um, anyway, he, he really was a gadfly. Uh, but at the end of the day, he persuaded Brian Mulroney's government that there was no justification for excluding gays and lesbians. And not only that, but that if they went to court, we actually now have, as part of a case I've been involved in, we've unearthed some of the government documents. The, the, the attorney general of the time said, look, if you let Clay Ruby take this to court, case to court, 
not only are we going to lose, but it's going to be really embarrassing for the government because we have lousy reasons for maintaining this policy. And we're going to look like we are a discriminatory uh, government and we, we don't want that. And so uh, Brian Mulroney decided to settle the case. Interesting, eh? You've got this uh, socialist, raving socialist in Clay Ruby, settling a case with a conservative prime minister to end a policy of discrimination. It's really uh, a delicious bit of our legal history. And of course, that has stood ever since 1992. Uh, we're celebrating the 30th anniversary of that important case this year. It's a great story. Thank you very much for uh, sharing it with us. We're chatting tonight with uh, Douglas Elliott. He is a friend and uh, confidant and uh, colleague of uh, Clayton Ruby, uh, a renowned uh, a lawyer who passed away last week. We're going to take a break for some messages and be back in just two minutes with uh, some more recollections from Douglas Elliott. I'm going to ask him about Guy Paul Morin and, uh, and wrongfully convicted uh, people as well. Stay with us, everybody. Welcome back, everyone, to the Brian Crumby Radio Hour on Saga 960. This is a really interesting conversation for me uh, because I've always read about Clayton Ruby and, and heard about him. I actually, Douglas, had an opportunity to be uh, on a panel with him. Uh, I was chair of Transit Alliance about a decade ago. I have been since then, but about a decade ago. And uh, uh, Clayton Ruby was one of our panelists. I wasn't sure why exactly he was a panelist, uh, but I was surprised that he was very passionate about uh, transit. And uh, and he he did that. Um, I think for a couple of reasons. Number one, he just thought it was right um, and it was the right way to develop a, a, a city. But then he also thought that, um, and, and he wasn't the person who, who said this line, but uh, he quoted the line in the speech, something to the effect of uh, a great city isn't where the poor ride transit, but a great city is where the rich uh, ride transit. But he thought that transit was uh, important um, for, from a social standpoint, that people could get to work and, uh, and that uh, they could get around the city and they could socialize. And, and so um, I had, uh, I had an interesting experience where I was the, the chair of uh, the organization and got to introduce him and got to meet him and got to question him. And so that was my very small interaction with uh, Clayton Ruby. Um, it's maybe not, you could... not surprising to me. And of course, I think Clay would also be in favor of public transit because he was a great believer in protecting the environment. He and David Suzuki are very good friends. I didn't know that. And, That's yeah, and so, uh, yeah, they've been friends for a very long time. And uh, so Clay uh, Clay is a, a Clay would march in lockstep with David Suzuki on, on any uh, environmental issue for sure. So I think he would support it on that grounds too. So although he was a very wealthy guy, he inherited money from his father and he made a good living as a lawyer. Uh, believe me, he didn't do all his cases for free, <laughs> far from it. Um, but, uh, you know, he lived, he and Harriet lived very well. People used to tease him mercilessly, uh, Clay, about his wine cellar, because uh, he was a big wine snob. And in fact, when he was running the Law Society, uh, he was temporarily the head of the Law Society. He tried to become the per permanent head and uh, he was unsuccessful. Some people said it was because he was too far left, but uh, people used to tease Clay and tell him that the real reason was that we couldn't afford the wine budget if he was in charge of the Law Society. Anyway. Uh, that it's that's great. just uh, that's just uh, he's a you know he's a bit complicated. Clay was Douglas. Uh, take a minute if you could and tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, so you're a lawyer, yeah, specializing in constitutional law. Is that correct? Yes, I do constitutional law and class actions. So uh, I first learned of I'm younger than Clay, as I said. So I first read about Clay and he was re representing the body politic and Glad Day Bookshop. And I was so grateful that we had a powerful lawyer who was uh, advocating for my community. I mean, I was in law school when the bathhouse raids happened in 1981. So I, I knew that we needed help. And I was very grateful uh, for uh, Clay's involvement. So, And I got to know some of the people that he was uh, acting for as a law student and, and young lawyer. And then I ended up doing a lot of work for the uh, Canadian AIDS, for the AIDS movement, for the Canadian AIDS Society. Uh, I ended up being uh, 
involved in a number of important LGBT rights cases like same-sex marriage. Uh, I also ended up at the Creever Inquiry um, and uh, became uh, very good friends with Clay's then law partner, Marlis Edward. Marlis Edward and Clay Ruby were law partners for, I think, 20 or 30 years, quite a long time. Uh, and uh, also, I became friends with Sven Robinson, who's a longtime friend of Clay Ruby's. Uh, and Clay uh, ended up a good friend of mine, Reverend Brent Hawks, was falsely accused of a criminal offense a number of years ago. And uh, he wanted Clay to represent him. And so I was a part of the defense committee for uh, Reverend Hawks and worked very closely with Clay uh, on that case and got to sort of see his uh, amazing legal mind uh, at work from close up. Um, and uh, he's, you know, apart from the sort of great causes that he's been involved in so effectively, he was also a uh, hardworking criminal lawyer and he defended people like Guy Paul Moran uh, who were uh, wrongfully accused, you know, and, uh, that was one of his passions, I understand, is uh, absolutely protecting uh, wrongfully accused and, and, and getting them out of jail. Yeah, absolutely. And I would say that uh, it, Clay, you know, for a lot of people, a lot of lay people, they say, well, how, if you're a criminal lawyer, how can you represent someone who's really horrible? If they're an axe murderer or they're a serial killer or whatever, how can you possibly represent them? And I think from Clay's perspective, he believed very passionately that it was important as a criminal lawyer to represent people who were accused of the most horrible crimes because those people were entitled to a defense and, and not infrequently, they were actually innocent. That the police would, like Guy Paul Moran is a classic example. Guy Paul Moran was a guy who was uh, just in the wrong place at the wrong time. He was a bit of an odd duck. And the there was this terrible murder uh, of a young girl. And the police were under pressure to solve the crime. And they pinned it on Guy Paul Moran. Mm -hmm. And they were wrong. Right. They were wrong. It was someone else. And he was later... He, he, eventually, the, he was uh, vindicated. He was vindicated through the courts, but then he was later, you know, now that we have DNA, we're able to use DNA testing to both uh, clear people, and it was used to clear Guy Paul Moran, but they were actually later able to identify the actual killer. And it was a neighbor of Guy Paul Moran. So it was indeed somebody who was living in the neighborhood of this young girl, but they got the wrong guy. Um, and so that, that was a classic Clay Ruby situation because Guy, as I say, Guy Paul Moran, he wasn't gay or, or uh, anything like that, but he was just, uh, he wasn't a very um, sophisticated guy. He was a bit of an oddball uh, in, in that, the place where he lived. And, uh, you know, simply put, he was an easy target for the police. He was an easy target for the police. They could push him around. And it was easy to persuade people that this weird guy was the one who was probably a child killer. And, you know, if you're accused of child molesting or killing a child or any of those, it, you know, those are really awful crimes. And people uh, want to give you a wide berth. Uh, you need somebody like Clay Ruby if you are innocent and you're accused of a crime like that. So I I have tremendous respect for him and for other criminal lawyers in my profession who take on those high profile controversial cases unflinchingly. Clay never batted an eye. It didn't matter what the nature of the accusations were. Didn't matter. You know, in some ways for him, the more controversial, the better. He wasn't afraid of anything. The more controversial, the better. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if it was going to be in the media and he had to defend his client's reputation in the media, no problem. He was ready for it. So um, abortion rights, right to choose, um, LGBT rights, uh, the rights of animals, 
uh, environmental issues, um, yeah. rights of uh, those individuals wrongfully uh, accused, um, even the worst criminals that still um, deserve uh, a good defense. That's yeah. a pretty big list. Anything else? Yeah. Well, uh, let me give you two others that uh, your listeners will have heard of. Another very unpopular organization that he represented, the Church of Scientology. Uh, you know, it it's a cult. <laughs> and he, they were having trouble with the law. And most lawyers in Toronto would not touch them with a barge pole because they were a cult. And Clay Ruby had no difficulty stepping up and representing the Church of Scientology. And the other case that's quite well known, I think people may not, people outside the legal profession may not remember the name of the case, but they'll remember the situation. Uh, another famous Supreme Court case of Clay's is the Askov case. In the Askov case, the issue was that the accused had been charged with a terrible crime that had taken a very long time to get to trial. And Clay argued that it had taken too long and it was impossible for Mr. Askov to get a fair trial because the state had just taken too long and that it wasn't fair to him to have this hanging over his head for years. And also the longer it took to get to trial, the harder it was to mount a defense, to gather evidence and, you know, witnesses didn't remember things anymore, et cetera. And he managed to persuade the Supreme Court of Canada to stay the charges against his client and to say that, and they issued a, an edict basically to all police, crown attorneys and judges across the country that they couldn't just drag their feet and drag these cases out, that judges would be a lot, uh, obliged if they didn't get these cases to trial in a reasonable time to throw the charges out, even serious charges. It was really controversial when it came down and it really uh, disrupted the legal system a lot because I was not thanking Clay for it, I've got to tell you, because I do mostly civil cases and having all of my civil cases moved to the back of the line so that Clay's criminal cases and his colleagues' criminal cases could go to the front of the line didn't thrill me. But I must say, I had to take my hat off to Clay because that's a, that's a pretty controversial position to sell to a judge that, uh, you know, potentially a murderer should walk free because he didn't get a, a fair trial. That's a that's a tough sell. So you know, I guess I I uh, incorrectly thought we had a right to uh, a trial within a reasonable time period. Within yeah, we do we we do now. <laughs> but Before that's the in, outcome, that's Clay Ruby again. That's it's not in the not, Charter of Rights. It it's it was implied in the Charter of Rights. But again, it's not something that was brought to you by Brian Mulrooney or Stephen Harper or, or Justin Trudeau. That is thanks to the Supreme Court of Canada and thanks to, to Clay Ruby. We're chatting tonight with Douglas Elliott, a friend, uh, a, a colleague of Clayton Ruby, who passed away last week. Um, and we're remembering some of the important legal cases. I'm going to take a break, a final break, and come back and ask Douglas uh, for some personal memories of his friend, Clayton Ruby. Stay with us, everybody. Welcome back, everyone, to the Brian Crombie Radio Hour on Saga 960. Douglas Elliott is a constitutional, constitutional lawyer with uh, Cambridge LLP in, uh, in Toronto. Uh, he's an LGBT activist. He's a friend and colleague of Clayton Ruby, who passed away last week. Uh, Clayton Ruby is one of those lawyers that I think all of us have heard about. Uh, and certainly, uh, um, you know, I think, you know, I'd be interested, Douglas, if you know of, uh, you know, is there another lawyer in Canadian history that has been as renowned and has had uh, as big an impact on uh, on the legal system? Um, maybe a Supreme Court justice, I'm not sure. Uh, but uh, he certainly uh, is renowned. I wonder, you know, we've talked about a bunch of the legal cases. You've talked about wine. Uh, and his wine <laughs> cellar. You've talked about his uh, Rolls Royce, or at least his father's Rolls Royce. Um, have you got any other personal stories you can share with us about uh, your friend Clayton Ruby? Yes. Well, uh, the side that uh, 
you know, lawyers are human beings too. And uh, Clayton was a human being for sure. He was a family man, very much a family man. He had two daughters um, uh, and uh, he had a beautiful wife, has a beautiful wife, now a beautiful widow, Harriet Sachs. Um, Harriet's a very talented lawyer in her own right. As I say, for a while, she was uh, his uh, law partner. She's now a judge of the Superior Court. Um, but, you know, uh, you're a very lucky person. And especially when you're a lawyer like Clay, who is a, he was a workaholic for sure. And, uh, you know, a social activist and he, he burned the candle at both ends. If you're going to do that, you need a loving partner who's going to support you. And, uh, back in 2005, my father had a major heart attack and was at Toronto general hospital. And uh, he was in for surgery. I went into the waiting room and uh, lo and behold, in comes Harriet Sachs. And she looked like she'd been hit by a truck. She looked terribly distressed. And uh, I said, you know, like what, what, what brings you here? It's, you know, is your father in hospital or something? She said, no, it's Clay. He's having open heart surgery. And I said, oh, my God, you know, I mean, so Clay then, so that's 17 years ago, he would have been 63, he wasn't that old. Um, so I was quite shocked. Uh, but you could see how distressed she was. And then about four or five days later, I was there. And there was Clay, like, walking down the hall with Harriet, arm in arm, and he looked like he had just got up from a nap. He didn't look like what a tough bugger. But the really thing that the thing that really amazed me, and I you could see was the tenderness between the two of them. You could see the love, you could, the relief on Harriet's face, um, and I thought, and you could, and they, how they were closely holding on to each other. And so he, she was literally physically supporting him as he was walking down the hall. I thought, you know, there's two very lucky lawyers that they found each other, uh, that they share so many passions, and, but they're still a very loving and tender. And Clay was very lucky to have had that great love affair in his life. Um, but of course, it's very sad for Harriet now because I know that she will be finding it very, very difficult uh, to move on to a new paradigm of life without clay. It's going to be tough for her. Well, I'm sure it is. And, and uh, my condolences to you um, with uh, the passing of your friend uh, and colleague as well. But thank you for taking the time to share um, both your friendly uh, personal recollections as well as your legal recollections of Clayton Ruby, who passed away last week. Uh, thank you so much. That's our show for tonight. Thank you all for joining us. I remind you I'm on every Monday through Friday at six o'clock on 960 AM. You can stream me online, uh, even from downtown uh, Toronto, Yorkville uh, at uh, www.saga960am.ca. Good night, everybody. Douglas Elliott, thank you so much. You're very welcome. Thank you. Bye-bye.